I'd like to call this regular council meeting to order. Would you all please rise for the invocation? We meet to serve our community and endeavor to be worthy custodians of all that has been entrusted to us. Let us be concerned only for what will promote good government. May we bring to our council chamber minds that think and hearts that feel so that in our deliberations we may display imagination, wisdom and courage and the will to do our work for the good of all. Thank you. Before we start, I want to begin this meeting by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is a traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Anishinaabe people, many of whom continue to reside in this community, along with uh, Métis and Inuit people as well. Madam Clerk, the roll call. All members of council are present at your worship with the exception of councillors Luberts, McDermott, and Butler. And we have uh, a number of delegations this evening, so the announcements will be brief. Um, this week, starting on Thursday, July the 18th, the Friendship Festival is taking place in its usual location along the river. Um, it's fitting that we have a delegation here with respect to the history of horse racing in Fort Erie. And on July the 21st, Sunday, is the annual Rick Schuler Memorial Race, which takes place around 354 or thereabouts, so be early so that you're there for the race. And then, of course, on Tuesday, July the 23rd, the Prince of Wales Stakes takes place, and the racing card, I believe, starts at 4 o'clock on uh, that Tuesday. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Councillor Dubineau. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I have to declare a conflict on two. Um, one on uh, 105-2019 to accept, or sorry, to exempt certain lots in Plan 59M-470 from part lot control. Um, block 69, parts 1 to 8, Peace Bridge Village, Ashton Homes Western Limited. Uh, as I live in a subdivision uh, developed by Ashton Homes Western Limited that has not been transferred to the municipality. And I also have to declare a conflict on 106-2019 to authorize the execution of an amending subdivision agreement with Marina Greenacres Development Incorporated, as the company I work for has been retained as a subcontractor for Marina Greenacres Developments Incorporated and the High Point Estates subdivision. Okay, so when we get to uh, the bylaws, we'll remove those from the bylaw package along with any other uh, bylaws that counselors may decide they want removed. Are there any other disclosures of pecuniary interest? There being none, that takes us to uh, notices of upcoming public meetings, of which there are none, which takes us to the Regional Councillor's Report. Good evening, Councillor Incina. Good evening, uh, Mayor Reddy Coffin, Councillors, and ladies and gentlemen. I will keep this brief, um, not like others. Uh, for many months now, um, there has been great interest uh, and debate on how uh, board positions at the NPCA should be filled. There is a report that has passed at the Planning and Economic Development Committee that proposes the region treat the appointments to the NPCA similar to those appointments made to the Niagara Regional Police Board. Um, a certain number of councillors will be appointed along with a number of citizens, and I believe the numbers will equal out. Interested citizens will be required to submit an application, and it would be scored on a matrix that will be developed the higher the score than the ma <clears throat> with the matrix will lead to an interview. There will be a panel struck, and they will conduct the interviews and run the process. This is yet to be ratified by Regional Council, uh, which will be on the 18th, I believe, of this month, and the appointments would take place in 2020. The, uh, 2020 or 2022? 2022, sorry. The Niagara Peninsula Conservation Foundation, the audit was just completed and the foundation had no improprieties. Everything was good. The, um, the foundation will still work to continue to rebuild uh, further growth of membership and along with uh, fundraising and promotions will be forthcoming. At the uh, committee meeting of the Planning and Economic Development, uh, the report from the Niagara Regional Housing market analysis, trends, current state, and forecasts 
1996 to 2041 was presented. Uh, I'm not sure if members of council has seen it, have seen this, but we'll forward it through. It's being brought to um, council again, regional council, um, for approval for the uh, <clears throat> for the recommendations in it. It's one that I believe that uh, will highlight just what we've been talking about with the need for affordable housing. Much talk has been heard about the automa an automated speed enforcement uh, working group that will be established uh, that will be reporting back to council with findings with regards to speed enforcement radar. Uh, this is to enhance the enforcement of speed zones in the region as there appears to be an increase over the past little while. This will not replace police officers, but enhance the, the capability of ensuring safer streets. In conjunction with this, the region is moving toward establishing community safety zones. Uh, the first two will be one in Niagara Lake and the other in Pelham. All of these initiatives are being looked at in order to make our streets and community safer. As we are well aware, the presence of police officers is a deterrent. However, there are, not, not, there are only so many police officers and the roads outnumber the officers significantly. They can't be everywhere at the same time. Niagara Specialized Transit continues to grow as it tries to meet the demands of its clientele. A transit study is forthcoming, I believe in August, and uh, we will see which model is best suited for Fort Erie and the rest of the region. A good news story from Public Health and Social Services. Um, committee passed a motion for the increase of two full-time positions that will deal with psychosis issues and intervention. The two positions will be added to Niagara Health Services and the cost, cost of these positions will be borne by the LIN. There is no cost, but that will be leveled down, pushed down. It is unclear where the two will be working, working out of, but services will be provided throughout the region. Um, Councillor Butler had asked about 5G. Thus far, from people who I've spoken to, uh, people in the business say there is no risk right now, but it's still before public health. And one last thing, Sunday, September, this Sunday, uh, July 23rd from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., I will be having my community conversation at Crystal Beach Makers Market. All are invited to attend if you'd like. I have extra chairs. I'm bringing along with me. That's Sunday or Tuesday? Sunday. That's July 21st. 21st. Sorry. Okay. I'm having a bad time. I just want to make sure you're I'm there. I'm having a bad time well, at Dates. Make sure you're there. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, did any members of council have any questions of the regional councillor? Councillor Dubino and then Councillor Noyes. Yeah, thank you, Worship, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Councillor Ensina. It's always nice to have you here. Um, just with regard to your comments about uh, NPCA appointments, uh, I'm, I'm sure you knew I would have some questions about that. Um, I, I, I have nothing against the idea of, you know, the, the mix of, uh, you know, elected representatives versus, um, you know, citizen appointments and, and that method. I'm fine with it. I'm just a little concerned right now about how the members are a portion to each local area municipality and uh, how that would work when you guys go about uh, determining the matrix who would uh, you know which local municipality would have someone who was a citizen appointee versus a uh, an elected representative I don't think this is a necessarily a, a question you'd have an answer to right now but I'm just wondering maybe you could get some information and uh, clarify that just so we have a better understanding of how that would all work Councillor Maybe you could forward the report with respect to that. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to see No, I haven't. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. That would be helpful. Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Riddickop. Through you to Mr. Insinia. Thank you for your, um, your presentation, for your information. Um, last time I asked you about the lagoon, about it, that it was being dredged, and was going to ask, I asked when and where the material that's being dredged is going. I wonder if you have any answer yet. I have not heard back yet from Public Works as to where it's going to go. Um, I believe they're still uh, working with the person who is going to be doing the work as to where exactly it's going. But I have, I have stayed on their case, uh, and I will remain asking that question of them. And as soon as I have it, I will send it right to you. Um, thank you for that response. The other thing is, I, I sent you an email, or yeah, I think it, about a garbage, uh, the um, leakage from the compost truck, um, with including uh, it was considerable leakage, including food pieces and everything else, despite the, the smell, the real issue here is the health hazard of the germs and the bacteria that may be growing in that stuff that's been fermenting um, for some time and then 
being left on the roadside in, in, a, in a residential area, even in a non-residential area. So I'm wondering if you had a chance to, to look into that. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have contacted uh, Public Works. I will be sitting down with uh, uh, Acting Commissioner Havermill uh, with regards to that, uh, and I will be bringing that forward to her. Uh, there, this is not the first time that has been seen and noted. It was, I believe, about two months ago, the same thing happened on Rebstock Road. Uh, and I believe they sent the truck out at that point in time to actually take a look and see if they could find anything. And it was a, a mixture of what was in the back of the truck with a bit of hydraulic fluid. There are major issues with uh, Emterra right now, and I will address that. And, and one further question, and, and I do apologize, I haven't had a chance to touch base with you on this. Um, I think the region's in charge of those big trucks that take the, I don't know what you call it, the, the excrement, the, the, the stuff that comes out of the um, wastewater treatment plants and stuff. Sludge. The sludge, that's what it's called, the sludge, and uh, puts it on uh, farmland. And I, I understand the value of it. However, um, they've recently done it on Shawble Road, and I think Shawble's kind of like a shared road, Shawble and Willow, between uh, Fort Erie and Niagara Falls. And they pretty much wreck the road um, to a good extent right on the corner there where you can kind of see the, um, the device kind of still in the, in the fields and the road now is just torn up. And if you actually go down a little further, you can kind of see the, the, the middle of the road rising because of the weight of the trucks. Now, s several years ago, I brought this up because they pretty much did the same thing on Point Avenue Road shortly after it was... Um, redone and pretty much that was a paved road and you could, out, you could see where the truck was, you could see where the pavement was giving. Now I know this isn't rocket science, I mean the trucks are obviously too heavy for, for the roads, but also are the roads, are these trucks allowed to go on roads that aren't um, strong enough to hold this kind of weight and do these trucks not have to go by the same guidelines for use of roads that other trucks have to do, like for the loads? Councilor Noyes, that's a municipal road, and that's something that I think our um, representative from Infrastructure Services can look into. That's something that the municipality should be concerned about. Um, it's fine, Councilor Incinna, you can get the drift of what's being said, but that's something the municipality should be looking into. I, I think, too, it's, I think the, the sludge, I think, is regional, though, right? Well, the sludge is regional. The road is, is municipal. There is communication between the town of Fort Erie and the region, and if the trucks, in fact, are exceeding the weight restrictions on a road, that's something that the municipality can deal with. We okay. don't have to have Mr. Councillor Encina get in the middle of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Councillor Encina. That then takes us to presentations and delegations, and the first delegation is Mr. Bill Galvin, who's going to provide us with some interesting history, and I see he's brought some of his friends, some of whom are rather distinguished individuals. Good evening. And tonight, um, tonight I will reach back into an earlier time in Fort Erie's storied history when rum runners and smugglers plied their trade on the Niagara River. When Fort Erie's population was much smaller than it is today, when horses were the main source of transport, but long after the Fenians had been chased out of Canada. But first, I would like to acknowledge some of the, our supporters here tonight, and I would start with Linda Rainey. Linda is the Managing D Director of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame, Stacy Roberts, editor and publisher of Thoroughbred Insight, Tom Rankin. Tom is a horseman. Tom is a horseman and president of Rankin Construction, known as Niagara's best builder, and the sponsor of the annual Sankin Run for Cancer that has raised millions. <clears throat> Ruby Smith, president of Fort Erie's Heritage Arts Legacy Association, and Adriana Jacoby, Sharon Dell, President of Birdie Historical Society, and Sherry, Sharon rather, 
Ruby and Adriano, along with members of the Birdie Historical Society, have provided tremendous help and support for this presentation tonight. Rick Cowan, longtime Ontario Jockey Club Senior Executive and recently retired Chief Executive Officer of Fort Erie Racetrack, Mr. Cowan journeyed from Florida to be here with us tonight. And Reinhold Nagel. Reinhold has been calling the horses to the post with his bugle at Fort Erie Racetrack for 58 years. That's 58 years. Tonight, uh, Reinhold is resplendent in his smart red and black uniform, uh, possibly with a bugle. <clears throat> um, we have Alex Wick and Bill McMahon, both had long riding careers. Uh, Bill McMahon has recently retired his position as steward with the Racing Commission. Uh, Richard Grubb, Richard Grubb, Richard's achievement as a professional jockey in North America and England uh, has just been fantastic, fantastic winning 100 mil, over 100 major stakes. He won seven straight races at Woodbine in 1967 and retired as senior steward with the Racing Commission, now living in Fort Erie. Uh, Carol E. Grummet, who has helped in this, in this venture, and Kirsty McKay, Gil Roundtree. Gil is an honored member of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame and one of the most successful trainers in Canadian thoroughbred racing history. And he's posted four victories in the Queen's Plate and three in the Prince of Wales. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, also uh, <clears throat> some of the, um, all, all of the descendants uh, of the man who signed the original uh, Johnston petition, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> but now, um, back to the presentation. Subject to the Fort Erie Racetrack, first opened in 1897. The following year, in 1898, W.J. Stockdale, a Fort Erie resident, approached Verde Township Council to propose a bylaw that would prohibit horse racing of any kind in Verde Township. In response to Mr. Stockdale's proposed legislation, Samuel Johnson, a local businessman, contractor, and horseman, presented a petition signed by himself and 270 ratepayers in which he noted rather forcefully that the prohibition of horse racing at Fort Erie would have serious economic consequences for the Fort Erie Jockey Club and also for the tax base of the township. Eventually, both Council and Mr. Stockdale recognized the merits of Johnson's argument and acknowledged the public support for the continuation of horse racing. As they say, the rest is history. Samuel Johnson saved horse racing and gave the town of Fort Erie a sustaining interest a sustaining industry for 121 years. From the beginning, the racetrack played a vital role, pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the town's economy during its 121 years. The track was the, 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 track was the heart of the town. It was the town's largest employer, and 240 jobs would be lost without it. This according to an article in the Toronto Star in 2012. Fort Erie Racetrack has had a pivotal role in Niagara's history, and Fort Erie history is incomplete without the mention of the racetrack. These are the words of Earl M. Plato, past president of the Bertie Historical Society. Grand Circuit President John Campbell writes from his New Jersey office, I applaud Samuel Johnson for his efforts and leadership in an, endeavor, in an endeavor that resulted in the grand circuit of harness racing in North America going stronger than ever over a century later. In 2013, Samuel Johnson was recognized for his huge contribution to the sport by the Canadian horse racing industry. When he was enshrined an honored member in the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame in the Legends Builder category. There he joined captains of industry like Sam McLaughlin, E.P. Taylor, Eugene Melnick, 
Frank Stronick, and Honorable Earl Rowe, former Lieutenant Governor of the Province of Ontario. Samuel Johnson can be favorably compared to Sam McLaughlin. Both men shared the same name of Samuel, or Sam as they like to be called. Both men were visionaries. Both men shared a love of horses. Both men are honored members of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame. And both men provided their communities with a defining industry. Sam Johnson with horse racing and Sam McLaughlin as founder of General Motors in Canada with horsepower. Everyone assembled here tonight, all residents of Fort Erie, and those have spent, who have spent their entire careers in the Canadian horse racing industry are all, all, in some way, beneficiaries of the leadership and action of Sam Johnson. The final chapter of Sam Johnson and the 270 men who signed the historic 1898 petition that has rested in the archives of the Fort Erie Museum for more than a century is 121 years in the making. That the final chapter has not been written. The town of Fort Erie can author that final chapter and proudly etch Samuel Johnson's name in an honored spot in its history. It can honor and acknowledge in a meaningful way his leadership, his foresight, his political insight that allowed for the growth and development of a defining industry in Fort Erie for 121 years. That's 121 years and counting. Thank you. Very much, Mr. Galvin. Um, so, there may be some questions from members of council, but I want to advise you that I've discussed this with the clerk, and uh, your brief and the information that we've gleaned so far from the um, historical society here, the, the museum, will be referred to the Corporate Services Committee. It seems to me that uh, not only uh, the town and the museum, but also the racetrack should be brought into this discussion. And it occurred to me as you were speaking that uh, we do have a sports wall of fame. And it may very well be that uh, there's adequate information that you've put together to support an application for Mr. Johnson to be recognized there. That's, um, that would then require us to bring in the uh, wall of fame committee, uh, which is supported by the Kinsman Club. So those are some of the things that uh, have occurred to us since you first started your dialogue with the town of Fort Erie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions by members of council? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this very informative brief and the uh, wonderful <coughs> picture. Th this actually looks a bit like you, I'm sure, when you were younger. Uh, not, that you're, not that you're not still young. Um, so we will, I will have the clerk uh, follow up with you with respect to progress in, uh, in our efforts to um, consider the recognition of Samuel Johnson uh, for uh, the service that he's provided to the town. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Galvin. Mm. That then takes us to uh, the next delegation. And uh, before we do that, if any of you who are here specifically with Mr. Galvin and wish to leave at this point in time, you may do so. Um, although you're certainly welcome to stay and listen to the balance of the uh, delegations. So if you gentlemen will just give us a minute. Um, one of you is Darren Platakis, one is Phil Davies, He's on. or Ian Lucas. Ian Lucas. You're Ian Lucas? Yes. And you are, sir? Darren Platakis. Okay, so Phil's not here this evening. Yeah, he sends his regrets. Thank you. And you're going to be discussing Oneagara 
aspiring geo, a global geopark. Yep. Great. So as soon as Janine closes the doors so that we can hear you, get you underway. Please proceed, gentlemen. Good evening, my name is Darren Platicus. I am the founder and executive director, director of an educational nonprofit called Geospatial Niagara. And I am also the acting chair of the Oneagra uh, Aspiring Global Geopark Steering Committee. Um, as I mentioned before, Phil Davis sends his regrets. He was held up in Welland this evening. And joining me is Mr. Ian Lucas, um, our board secretary of Geospatial Niagara, and also a member of the Oneagra Steering Committee. And thank you for having us here this evening. Really appreciate it. Um, we're here to provide you the Coles Notes uh, version about what a UNESCO Global Geopark is, and more specifically about the Oneagra Aspiring Global Geopark project. And by the end of the presentation, we're seeking the endorsement of the Oneagra Aspiring Global Geopark uh, by the town of Fort Erie as we gather support across Niagara to move through the application process. So maybe asking yourself, what is a global geopark? The UNESCO designation of a global geopark is a single unified geographical area where sites and landscapes of international geological significance are managed with a holistic concept of protection, education, and sustainable development. They're a bottom-up approach, um, combining conservation with sustainable development, involves local communities, and are, is becoming increasingly popular uh, globally. They are living, working landscapes with exceptional geological heritage, where science and local communities engage in a mutually beneficial way. Perhaps my favorite uh, definition of a UNESCO Global Geopark was that given by uh, Professor Patrick McKeever, and he visited us over the Victoria Day weekend, um, touring throughout Niagara and doing a flyabout uh, of, the, of the region. And his definition are those special places around the world that not only tell part of the history of the planet, but also celebrate how our geological heritage is linked with all other types of heritage. And this forms the basis of community empowerment and the promotion of the area's sustainable economic development. Oops. So currently there are uh, just over 140, almost 150 UNESCO Global Geoparks in the world. Uh, three of those are in Canada. The one, first one in Canada was in 2010. It was the Stonehammer Global Geopark in St. John, New Brunswick. The next one was in 2014, the uh, Tumbler Ridge UNESCO Global Geopark in Tumbler Ridge, British Columbia. And the most recent one in Canada in 2018 at Percé, Quebec. There are two other uh, global geoparks on the radar in Canada, and they are actually undergoing their UNESCO uh, evaluations this summer. The one is uh, Discovery Aspiring Geopark in Bonavista, Newfoundland, and the Cliffs of Fundy Aspiring Global Geopark in, uh, centered in Parlesboro, Nova Scotia. There are also, um, in addition to Oneagra, there are, other, there are six other aspiring global geoparks across Canada. Uh, including two in Ontario. One is Big Impact in Sudbury, and the other is at the Temiskaming Rift Valley in uh, the border of Ontario and Quebec. So each and every global geopark strives to incorporate and promote the local geopark pillars within their respective geoparks management plans. And these include education, sustainable, responsible tourism, cultural awareness, and geoconservation and geotourism. So you may be asking yourself, why Niagara? So UNESCO encourages cooperation with existing UNESCO designated areas, building upon relationships across Canada and around the world, sharing best practices and other forms of research and programs. Promotion and education as it relates to culture is particularly important in the establishment of a UNESCO Global Geopark, especially for our local indigenous communities, but also other cultures that now call Niagara home. The escarpment uh, in Niagara has driven our earliest industry and provides the perfect climate 
making us Canada's fruit belt and our wines are world renowned and soon our craft beers and distilleries um, are increasing in popularity as well. The Welland Canal exists because of the escarpment and stone for the construction of the historic canal locks and also for the construction of our most prominent buildings came from the escarpment. From farmers markets to hiking and cycling, Niagara is more than the typical tourist sees while they are here and we are fast becoming a four season experience destination. Niagara is also on the forefront of research in agriculture, sustainability, and a host of other disciplines that are prominent in other global geoparks. And designation would provide uh, another incentive for our post-secondary institutions to attract masters and postdoctoral candidates. So specifically for Fort Erie, and we just heard a great presentation with respect to the Fort Erie racetrack, but you also have other historical uh, attributes as well. You have obviously Fort Erie, a national historic site, and you have all of the archeology, span uh, especially at the Mewinza Archeology span Museum. And something you might not know, and I will try not to butcher this, um, fossils in Fort Erie, specifically the Nerapiscanthus denisoni, is the first vertebrate fossil collected from the late Silurian Birdie Formation. It was at Ridgemount Quarry. Um, it's, uh, the fish is the only near complete acathodian from the pre Devonian strata that's worldwide. And uh, when I found this out, I, I was pretty impressed by that. You have uh, kayaking and canoeing along Black Creek. You have the Friendship Fe Festival that you've mentioned. There's Brimstone Brewing, uh, Crystal Beach, Safari Niagara, and the Point Abano Lighthouse among many, many other assets that Fort Erie has that can contribute to the success of a UNESCO Global Geopark. So the application dossier, um, the sort of the, the method of applying for this designation is there's a formal self-evaluation that um, the community and the board uh, put together, work through. There's an application of the Canadian UNESCO uh, Geoparks uh, Network and they send two evaluators to Niagara to basically ground truth what we're doing in terms of our programs and our uh, management structure and our educational outreach and the like. Uh, after that uh, evaluation, there's a work through of the application again to sort of bolster it if there's anything that needs to be uh, rejigged and such. And then we operate essentially as a global geopark for one year. And then after that time, the application is sent to UNESCO in Paris and they send evaluators to Niagara to, again, ground truth it. So we're aiming for uh, submission of the application to the Canadian uh, Committee uh, the end of December of this year or the end of, between then and the end of March of next year. And uh, with the hopes of getting a global de the designation of Global Geopark in 2023 or 2024. So some of the uh, awareness and promotional opportunities that we have uh, include the 10th International Cool Climate Wine Symposium, the 2021 Canada Summer Games, the 2024 Total Solar Eclipse. If you remember the last total solar eclipse that went right across the middle of the United States, a lot of people that were in the peripheries of that eclipse wanted to flock to the center to witness the total solar eclipse. Um, and a lot of those uh, small towns benefited greatly from the influx of of tourism and people coming in. Um, there's also another 2024 world-class sporting event that I don't want to jinx by mentioning it. Um, but also the 2026 World Cup is coming to Toronto and we would be remiss to think that international visitors to Toronto that are going to see the World Cup wouldn't be coming to Niagara um, to see the falls, seeing as it's so close to, to where they are. These are some of our sponsors that we have involved uh, currently and partners. So in conclusion, the Oneacra Aspiring Global Geopark is an opportunity for all of Niagara to work together to promote what makes our communities and region unique uh, among the other UNESCO Global Geoparks worldwide. It's to educate ourselves and the world about the region humanity has called home for 12,000 years. We are truly unique from the ground up. And answer any questions.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Platakis. My question is, is there anything that you require from the town of Puerto Rico to assist you in your application? Um, Mayor Redekop, yes, there, there are three potential things. The first would be uh, an endorsement of the concept of the, uh, of the geopark that covers the whole of the Niagara region um, and, bring, and uh, diversifies the tourist interest in the region uh, dramatically as it has done around the world. The second thing um, would be to um, participate with the other municipalities other and, and the region um, in designating one or two members for our board, which is just being, being put together as we speak. And um, thirdly, we may be coming back for uh, an ask for some modest funding, and I, I do mean modest, um, to support the process that uh, Mr. Patakis was just talking about in terms of the um, UNESCO accreditation. Uh, that will be decided by the board members, and um, we hope to have some more, some more concrete asks in that direction uh, by September. Uh, most important thing would be if, if we want you to be enthusiastic about the about the uh, the benefits of the geopark, how it would benefit Fort Erie. Uh, that's that's our I guess our primary ask is is enthusiasm and support. Okay. Do any members of council have any questions of these gentlemen? Unfortunately, we have uh, short uh, short staffing on council this evening. Three of our members aren't available. And, uh, uh, any one of them may have had some questions, but um, appreciate your, your information, and I presume that the PowerPoint presentation has been provided to our clerk, so that can be circulated to members of council. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Our next delegation is Connie Stella and Paul Liu from the Fort Erie International Academy. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Reddick and councillors and community members of Fort Erie. It is with great pleasure that we are here this evening to present to you the Fort Erie International Academy. My name is Connie Stella, and I will be one of the principals at the school. My name is Paul Liu. I'm the director for this school. So we are Chinese and Canadian educators with a mandate of educating our young students on an East meets West philosophy and worldview model. China and North America are now the two largest economies in the world, and the relationships between them and these world economies are becoming increasingly interconnected. Knowledge about the international issues is important in our ever more global society, especially for future generations. Schools should be evolving to provide students with international skills and knowledge. Exposure to international educational experiences should be an important consideration when selecting a school. There is no better way to achieve this than the creation of a globally and culturally diverse student body that will be representative of the modern world. Can you maybe you can show us how to use this one? You might control it, see? Yeah. So, this is a, this one. so it should show a video. Oh. Yeah. So as you can see in the picture, we did have a video here. Um, this is where we are located at the old secondary elementary and secondary uh, elementary and secondary school of Fort Erie. And it's a beautiful big property. Um, and so we are really 
looking forward to starting this new venture here in Fort Erie. Oops. Thea tomorrow will include the establishment of a distinct on-campus residential community reflecting our commitment to a safe and caring environment while preserving our historical academic setting. FIA has great potential to create more local employment, increase opportunities for business growth, and give higher visibility for the Niagara region as a result. As the number of students increases, local businesses enjoy the financial benefits, the town is given a revitalizing boost, and a new growth opportunities are shared by the community. Who we are. The world needs leaders who have a foundation in global awareness and understanding, who are bridges between East and West, who are agents of change, ambassadors, innovators, and leaders on a global scale. Our goal is to instill this leadership mindset in our young people. We invite you to be partners with us in this endeavor. FIA brings students, students create business, and business increases opportunities. FIA has a capacity for 2,000 students, ideally. We hope to have 25% Canadian, 25% US, and 25% international, and 25% Chinese. Students experience diverse, diverse cultures and increase their global awareness. International students and Chinese students develop strong English language skills as well as an understanding of North America culture. A smooth transition into university um, and Canadian and international students also have an opportunity to appreciate Chinese culture and learn Mandarin throughout their elementary and secondary school years, as well as through exchange programs and co-op experiences. One of the unique things that we offer at FIA. FIA will represent a blend of international students who will require goods and services and who will invite relatives and friends from China and from all over the world to visit Fort Erie, injecting over five million of capital into the local economy. The expert leadership group that we have, uh, Jan Curten, um, is, um, our, is a former superintendent with the Peel District School Board and national director of student programs at the Learning Partnership. She is our associate director. Connie Stella, myself, former principal of Weifang Hanshan School in 271 Education Group in Weifang, China, Shandong Province. Uh, I've had 33 years of experience in education and opened the uh, first uh, Beryl Ford Public School in the Peel District School Board. David Ferguson has over 35 years of expertise in education and he was also the founding principal of the School of Liberal Arts and Toronto New School in Toronto and a respected consultant to private schools that seek his expertise and advice. Robert Van Eyck, Director of Admissions. He has extensive international experience, government relations, and executive management. And of course, Paul Liu, who is our Director of Education for Fort Erie International Academy, who has many, many uh, leadership skills and who has created a, a Connect to Canada International Program with the Peel District School Board and 271. Partners, solid established partnerships. Our, school, our Chinese partner is the 271 Education Group with schools all over China and more than 88,000 students. 271 is the top school board in China offering the best quality of education and is a model for the Chinese Ministry of Education. Parent company CTCs has successful experiences has been transitioning students to Canada uh, to study in the Peel District School Board for the past six years, with students being offered entry into top universities. 
Through the development of our co-op programs and local outreach efforts, FIA it will establish a solid bound between the school and the larger Fort Erie community, engaging the community to become um, integral partners and part of the le learning partnership that we will offer to our students and community. Fort Erie International School will um, have a multicultural environment, an, insta an insta outstanding educational program, and a teacher ratio of 1 to 15. We will have an, a stimulating after-school program, an international co-op and exchange opportunities for students in grades 11 and 12, as well as a summer program that we will offer uh, grade seven to 10 as well. And they would go to China. Uh, annual international excursions, co-curricular activities and sports teams, bursaries and scholarships will be offered, students accommodation, um, individual academic and personal counseling, university and college application services, and a caring and nurturing, nurturing environment. We hope to be a very inclusive school as well as a progressive school that will offer authentic teaching and learning opportunities and experiences for our students so that they can reach their maximum potential and be successful in their future careers. We will focus on learning styles and we will also focus on the development of critical thinking skills. Students focused and committed to a diversity of teaching methodologies that will lead our students to great success in all aspects of their lives. Students will start this year from grade seven to 12. They will be open-minded, future global citizens, future world leaders, eager to study Mandarin and English, and committed to personal growth and academic success. We will this year be offering um, bursaries and scholarships for 30 students from grades seven and eight of the local community free tuition so that they may have an opportunity to explore and experience Fort Erie International Academy and to have another learning opportunity that will be beneficial in their personal growth. So how much longer do you anticipate you'll be? Uh, actually, I'm just about done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we require your support in assisting FIA to deliver the message to the families in the Fort Erie Committee and invite them to join us. We will establish a mutually beneficial future with Fort Erie International Academy and the Niagara region. At this point, I just would like to invite um, all the council members. Um, an invitation, we will be hosting a community barbecue, just sort of greet and meet and hear about FIA and have our neighbors and community members come and participate and get a chance to meet some of the staff and see the school, the renovations that we're doing. And that'll be on August 2nd. We will be delivering a personalized um, invitation to all members of council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Stella. Can I just, uh, you know, quickly give me, me one and a half minutes? Just uh, want to express my appreciation to Mr. Mayor and all the councillors. And uh, with your support, we became a part of the uh, Fort Erie community. And uh, in a very short, short time, we have started hiring uh, local residents and engaging the local business. And we also uh, already invest uh, another close to $5 million extra uh, in the local. And uh, our plan is in the next five years, we want to uh, plan to invest another $100 million in Fort Erie. So with your leadership, we will work really hard to um, help to you know, boom the economy and create jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Any members of council have any questions? Councillor Noyes and then Councillor Duvall. Okay. Um, uh, through the mayor, to, to the president, thank you for your presentation. I have um, a few questions. One is the curriculum. Will it be following the, and I know it's called something, but I'm probably wrong, Canadian Educational Standards? The Ontario Curriculum, yes. And when do you anticipate the building, the actual build-out for the accommodations? 
And the renovations to the existing high school? Uh, we are in the uh, working progress. Uh, the latest information, uh, got, you know, we work with Qualtech. Uh, the latest information um, is by the plan is by in one year. Uh, we build half of the building. Uh, can, uh, we expect it can accommodate to 900 students. And in the second year, uh, will be in a four building. And uh, the total student in residence, we are uh, now working on about 1,500 in residence. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Dubino. Yes, thank you very much, Your Worship. And uh, <coughs> through you to the uh, presenters, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's great to have you up here with giving us a bit of information on something we've been following for quite some time. Um, just one quick question. You had mentioned scholarships for the, the local community. And if, if there's anyone in Fort Erie who's interested in, in applying, um, would you happen to have some information or is there anything you can share about how to, to go about that process? Uh, yes, they can go to our FIA website and it gives all the information there. Um, and our FIA website is www um, at fia.ca and once they go to that website there'll be like a bar along the along the top and they'll go to register now and then they can continue from there they fill out initially a, a small information part and then it gets submitted and then somebody connects with them and we meet with the families and we talk about what it is that we can do yeah thank you very much yeah and it's mostly geared to the grade seven and eights all right perfect okay any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation and the information that you've provided to us. Thank you. Thank you. That then takes us to our final uh, delegation, Emily Pinkard, uh, with respect to the Bay Beach uh, parking. Good evening. Hi. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, my name is Emily Pinkard, and this is Janice Perlstein. She authored the letter that is found is the third item in the package that you were submitted, uh, that we submitted to you. Um, and so Janice is my mother-in-law. She's a resident in Bay Beach. And um, she's asked me to help her by speaking on her behalf tonight. But um, I'm mostly conveying her, own, her, uh, her message. So I just wanted to introduce you to her quickly. Um, in any event, in your package, you'll see that um, I've attached another copy of the letter that was circulated to council um, about two weeks ago, which was authored by uh, my mother-in-law. And it concerns the driveway permit rule with respect to the uh, Bay Beach parking bylaws. I'm hoping that you all had a chance to review the letter. Um, if not, then hopefully I can give you a brief summary today. But uh, in any event, in the letter I'd promised to bring a, um, we promised to bring a petition of uh, petitioners from that area who have agreed to, you know, support the contents of the letter. And the petition is also attached to the package, and you'll see that it has over 200 signatures. Um, it was collected electronically, uh, and that was within only two weeks without any door knocking. Um, it was really just sort of circulated on social media and through friends and neighbors, and we were able to get, um, you know, about 200 signatures um, to date. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to that as promised. And um, so I guess my presentation really is uh, um, sort of just reiterating uh, most of the comments uh, contained within Janice's letter um, and that there are uh, many constituents from the Bay Beach area who have taken issue with the specifically the driveway permit rule. And when I say driveway permit rule, what I'm referring to is they're not, they're not objecting to par paid parking on their streets. They're objecting to specifically the fact that they're disqualified from getting a resident parking permit by virtue of the fact that they may have the potential to have a driveway on their property. And um, so w when I say that we're asking you to revisit that bylaw and hopefully amend it, that's the only thing we want you to amend. It's, it's not, you know, we don't want all of the parking bylaws to be re-looked at. It's just that we would like for these residents who are on the affected streets to be able to obtain one or two, ideally two resident permits that are vehicle transferable, um, that they can use for their, themselves, their family, their visitors, um, so that they don't, they don't have to be subject to the high parking rates that were implemented for people, tourists, and surrounding residents that are coming to the beach. And so that's really what we're here for today, is to ask council whether you would um, consider revisiting the driveway permit rule specifically. Um, and I think that also there's, 
maybe it be, might be worthwhile to have a show of hands of the people who are here today to support the uh, parking bylaw. So we also had a few people that came out to show their support um, that are also hoping to see the, the amendment made. Um, and then from a substantive standpoint, uh, you'll see I have just like a very brief, very brief sort of uh, summary of the, the arguments or the reasons why we think that the, um, the driveway permit rule is, uh, you know, sh should be amended. And so the first one is, of course, the inconvenience and cost to the affected residents, um, which is particularized in the letter. And in essence, it, it, it amounts to about $1,000 a summer for each vehicle at the home. Um, and that also comes along with inconvenience. If you want to leave your car on the street for more than a day, you would have to make arrangements with somebody to go and buy you a new you know, parking ticket every day that you're away on vacation. Or um, you know, if you have a visitor that wants to just come for lunch or uh, you want to throw a birthday party for your niece, they're all going to be, you know, they want to be able to have people over and not have to um, have their guests also you know, be required to pay these exorbitant parking fees. And so for the residents, they have two options. They can pay the parking at the, you know, on-street parking rates, which is $10 for a day, or they have the alternative, which is to install a driveway on their property, which comes with the cost of potentially surveys, engineers, uh, you know, the materials, the labor, permits. And so their alternative to spending $1,000 a month on a parking spot, or sorry, a summer per vehicle on a parking spot is to construct a driveway at another exorbitant cost. And I think that for most of these residents, it was just sort of unforeseen that this was going to, you know, many of them were not following council's, uh, you know, proposed bylaws and whatnot, and all of a sudden they got hit with this fee or alternatively constructing a driveway, which may not be something that they budgeted for. And so they're, you know, having to spend $10 a day right now um, during the summer months for their car which is considerable inconvenience and cost. Um, and then on another note, they feel that um, you know, the, their tax dollars and their say, their voice as residents um, in the Bay Beach community is being um, not necessarily disregarded, but that the tourists who are coming you know, for one or two days a summer and paying their $10 to park on the street, that they're giving preference over the residents who live there and who are in many cases um, I mean, like, I'm a fourth generation now. Um, our children will be fourth generation Crystal Beach residents. And we're feeling that, you know, as people who have been keeping this community alive for years and years and years, um, and then to now they feel like, you know, they're almost being penalized or punished by virtue of the fact that they live within close proximity to the Bay Beach area. And um, so that's just you know, how a lot of the, in discussions with a lot of the, the neighbors and surrounding residents, I feel that's how a lot of them are feeling. Another note that is not in any of the material, but that someone brought up to me earlier tonight was that what's happening is that residents who can't afford to pay $10 a day for the entire summer are now parking their cars on the, the other streets, the neighboring streets where parking is not pay parking. And so there are also residents here today who don't even live on the affected streets, they live on the neighboring streets, and they're complaining about, and that's going to be the next wave of complaints, will be that um, you know, they have people parking their boats and parking their trailers and parking their SUVs, and you know, they're bringing everything they used to park in front of their home, and now they're moving it up the street onto other people's properties and other people's streets, and those streets are becoming more crowded because they're having to deal with this overflow, and so you know, people who are on the affected streets will park their car and then walk back to their house. And that's kind of like the collateral issue that has sort of come up as a result of this. Um, and then we also noticed, or I noticed, uh, that the, uh, we think there's an inconsistency with the Bay Beach Master Plan, which um, is on the second page of the letter, or the third last page, uh, second last page of your um, package. And in essence, it said on the Bay Beach Master Plan that pay and display parking would be limited to weekends and holidays, and that on-street parking should be available to homeowners and their visitors through permits displayed on the dashboard of cars. And so, with the process to obtain a resident permit being as involved as it is, it's excluding these disqualified residents and being vehicle-specific, the new parking bylaw is inconsistent with the master plan for that reason. The master plan said residents should be able to get permits so they can continue to park on their street. 
and then the new bylaw has completely disqualified anybody from getting a permit unless they don't have driveway potential. And quite frankly, I don't, looking around the property or looking around the streets, I don't see very many properties that wouldn't have driveway potential or at least the space for a driveway. <clears throat> um, and then I think perhaps what concerns um, most of the petitioners the most, or at least what's been relayed to me, is their concern over green space and um, recognizing the character of the area and that it's a destination because it's a green space and it's a place that people can come to get respite from a city, which is why you have so many tourists and you have so many seasonal residents who are coming there because they want to feel like they're in a cottage country and they're in a beach community. And when you drive down the streets right now, there's grass lining both sides of the street. And, you know, some people have, you know, a little bit of gravel or something where they might park. But for the most part, it's, a, it's a, like a green community. And that was also reflected in the master plan, which stated that, you know, recognizing and enhancing the existing character of the neighborhood was identified as a very important principle for any new development in Bay Beach. And um, they're re-envisioning Bay Beach as a green jewel on Lake Erie's shoreline. Things like that. And so they even mentioned that they would like the, the town parking lots to not be paved and not be concrete and not be asphalt because they wanted to have it be, keep the green character. And so the way that the residents feel is like, oh, well, the city gets to keep their parking lots looking green and pretty, but we have to install concrete on our front lawn because we're no longer can afford to park on the street. Um, as a result of this driveway permit rule. And so I think the green space um, concern is perhaps the, you know, the primary concern, um, aside from the cost and inconvenience, um, is that people are thinking that you know, three years from now, once everyone gets their driveways constructed, if the rule isn't amended, you're going to drive down Lakewood and Ashwood and Beachwood and all those streets, and it's just going to be concrete driveways, asphalt driveways, gravel driveways, and a lot of the grass space that you see right now is going to be taken away trees will have to be removed. Um, and, you know, and then there's going to be concerns with stormwater management and plowing and, you know, it just escalates. And so I think that um, the green space is, is something that, um, it seems like a short-sighted policy with respect to maintaining the green space in the area. And so um, to uh, conclude, we would like to see um, the driveway permit rule, specifically that rule, um, be amended um, or abolished, um, an amendment would be sufficient to say that you don't, just to take out that if you have driveway potential, you are not eligible for a resident permit. Everybody just, they just want to be able to get a permit without having to construct a driveway. Um, and that's uh, the essence of the argument, I would say. They'd also hoped that um, we could request for an interim arrangement so that if there is a discussion to take place in council about whether or not you'd be willing to revisit this um, if there is a possibility of having an interim. And I know that there's logistics and it could be a nightmare, but um, whether a, an interim arrangement could be put in place where residents could obtain permits, because a lot of them are really struggling right now to shuffle around cars and obtain, you know, pay for parking every day and who's going to park where and, you know, do I drive up to your house and walk back down to mine and things like that. So there was also a request for an interim arrangement but um, subject to any questions you might have, those are, are my submissions on the Bay Beach parking issue. Thank you very much, Ms. Pinkard. Do any members of council have any questions? Council Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Rita Pappas, Mrs. Pinkard. Mrs. Pinkard, thank you for your presentation. I, I see you're very passionate about this issue. Um, I have a few questions. Um, the first one being, you went around the, 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 the having to have a driveway where there's one, if there's space available. Um, is that your chief complaint, or is it is it the cost? Is it the timeline that it you know you just it just doesn't happen overnight? Um, there wasn't enough time for people to put the driveway in, or you don't want the driveways at all. People don't want driveways because they cost a lot of money, and it's changing the like it's changing the character of their property. They may have gardens out on their front lawn. They may have just a big beautiful lawn that has nice grass on it and it's growing green and they park on the street and they are able to maintain a lawn space where you know their dog can play and their kids can play and soon they're going to have to change the entire character of their property in some cases a property that's been in their family for years to put in a driveway because they can't afford to pay the daily parking rates and they also can't get a resident parking permit from the city because the city deems them to have driveway potential and so that's the issue with them is 
they don't want to have to modify their property. They don't want to be have someone else dictate how they have to modify their property because they have they're sort of caught in a catch twenty two where they no option is really good for them. <laughs> so I think that's it. And there's cost either way. There's cost if you pay for the parking on the street, and there's cost if you modify your driveway. So um, I think that's the chief complaint is that. Um, they just want things to stay the way they always were. They don't mind having a bunch of tourists park out in front of their house. They haven't complained about that. They haven't complained about the you know pay parking meter things that have been put right in front of people's cottages. Their complaint is that if there's going to be paid parking there as residents, they shouldn't be subjected to the pay parking and they should be able to obtain a resident permit whether or not they have driveway potential. Um, further to that, how many parking permits would you Suggest I would think so. two. Okay. Um, are you aware of any complaints prior to this, let's say last year, the year before, prior years, yeah. um, in regards to residents complaining that there was no control of parking and tourists were parking here, there, and everywhere, and people couldn't get out of their driveways or you know, couldn't park their own cars? Um, I'm not aware of that. I mean, I, we're on Lakewood, so we're, like, even this weekend, it was a beautiful weekend. It was 30 degrees both days. There were no tourist vehicles parked on our street. There, nobody went to the parking meter. Nobody was parked there. So it's hard for me to, to speak to that. But I, I would understand if there had previously been um, complaints about chaos on the street. But my thinking is that, you know, when I was down in Crystal Beach this weekend, the streets that come right up from the beach were packed with cars. So obviously, you know, the tourists or, or the visitors who are using the beach they could be residents. Um, whoever's using the beach, they're parking on the most proximate streets. The more distal streets, they're, they're not parking there at all. And so if you were to allow residents on those proximate streets, permits, they're going to take up, you know, two spaces, you know, for maybe one house. But the tourists, will, the visitors will still be able to park because there's so much parking space on all the more distal streets. If you, it looks crowded right when you look at the beach, but if you look up and you go over the Lakewood or you, you go up to, you know, the other streets, you can see that um, there's a lot of space. So there's, it's not like there's a shortage of spots. There's no shortage of spots. There's plenty of parking on those streets and the tourists or the, par the residents, the visitors, whoever's coming to use the beach and needs a place to park, they can go all the way over to one side or the other side and find a parking spot, no problem. This weekend, our street didn't have a single car parked on it mostly because the residents weren't paying the fee and the tourists, it was just too far of a hike, I guess, for them. But I imagine that if you were to grant our request and overturn the driveway permit rule, it would not not result in overcrowding of the parking because you can see right now, if you go for a drive on a Saturday, that most of the streets are not even full. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noyes. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, thank you. That then takes us to uh, the consent agenda. Are there any items that anyone wishes removed from the consent agenda? Yes. If not, Councillor Zanko, you have the resolution with respect to the consent agenda items. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Dubineau. The council approves the consent agenda items as recommended. Any questions or comments, Councilor Dubinow? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick comment regarding the, uh, the Environmental Advisory Committee minutes. I just want to thank them for uh, taking into consideration um, my earlier request regarding the environmental con uh, conservation overlay in Garrison Village. I, I note here that they've uh, recommended it be removed. Um, I'm sure the residents in that area appreciate it so that they have the flexibility to get building permits, put up, you know, do stuff like that. So I really appreciate that. I just wanted to extend that to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, and I noticed that they dealt with that rather quickly as well. Uh, Madam Clerk, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but there was uh, you correct spelling of council in uh, one of the minutes. Yeah, page 20, last line in the uh, June 17th, 2019 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, I'll call uh, the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. That then takes us to 
new business inquiries and uh, Councillor Dubino, you have the first resolution under that. Yes, I do, Your Worship. Uh, move. Oh, I, oh. I, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, there was an addendum to our agenda, and uh, that is with respect to Bylaw 116 2019. Sorry, we're going to get to that, but I, uh, as I was shuffling through my papers, I noticed it. Please proceed. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and it's seconded by Councillor Noyes that uh, the Council of the Corporation of Town of Fort Erie consents to the passage of bylaw number 2019-52 of the Regional Municipality of Niagara being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 112-2013, a regional bylaw to protect children and vulnerable persons from exposure to outdoor secondhand smoke. Questions or comments with respect to that resolution? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Councillor Noyes, you have the next resolution. Well, thank you, Mayor. Moved by myself and second by Councillor Dubonneau that Council accepts the resignation of Bob Allen from the Communities in Bloom Committee and further, the Council directs staff to proceed with filling the vacancy in accordance with the procedural bylaw. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. I'm going to go back to you, Councillor Dubonneau. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably be bouncing back and forth quite a bit tonight. Uh, thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes, that Council accepts the resignation of Leah Fiore from the Fort Erie Public Library Board, and further, that Council directs staff to proceed with filling the vacancy in accordance with the procedural bylaw. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favour? None opposed. That is carried. And Madam Clerk, I suppose at this point you want us to give you your, our, our ballots if we haven't already done that. Yes, please, Your Worship. Once the results are tabulated, Councillor Dubonnel, you, you have the resolution with respect to the appointment of the new member. Your Worship, the successful applicant is Larry Graber. Okay, Councillor Dubonneau, if you would insert his name. Yep. Proceed. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes, that Council appoints Larry Graber to the Fort Erie Public Library Board for the period ending November 14th, 2022. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. And that takes us then to uh, back to Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Dubonneau, the Council accepts the resignation of Robert Brown as the Beachcombers Senior Center Representative from the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, and further, the Council directs staff to proceed with filling the vacancy in accordance with the procedural bylaw. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. And Councillor Noyes, you have the next resolution appointing the replacement. Thank you. Moved by myself and seconded by Council Dubonneau, the Council appoints Mary Franks to the Senior Citizen Advisory Committee as a Beachcomber Senior Senator Representative to the period ending November 14th, 2022. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Are there any other um, new items of new business or inquiries? If not, then Councillor Dubonneau, you... We're going to move to uh, motions, and you have a motion. Yes, I do, Your Worship. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, so bear with me. <laughs> moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes, that uh, whereas the Town of Fort Erie has policies in place to ensure that it is accountable to the public for its actions, and that its actions are transparent to the public, including the accountability and transparency policy outlined in bylaw number 19507, and whereas whistleblowing by employees and local government can bring critical knowledge about misconduct and failed policy outcomes and priorities to the attention of politicians and or public, and whereas the provincial government 
as well as other municipalities and agencies in Ontario have in place policies and or legislation that provide legal protection from discriminatory or disciplinary action for employees who disclose wrongdoing of any kind in the context of their workplace in good faith and to a competent authority, and whereas voters in the regional municipality of Niagara, including the town of Fort Erie, sent a strong message on October 22nd, 2018, for the need for accountability and transparency in the way local governance is conducted, and whereas it is always desirable to build upon and enhance existing policies that further strengthen public trust in the accountability and transparency of the way their local government functions. Now therefore be it resolved that council directs staff to prepare a report with respect to a whistleblowing policy for the town of Fort Erie, and further, that the Municipal Council of the Town of Fort Erie fully supports whistleblowing and is committed to protecting whistleblowers, the important information they provide, and more widely, the integrity of the whistleblowing process. All persons who are considering reporting their concerns in good faith can be assured that their concerns will be taken seriously, their identity will be protected, and as an employee of our municipality, that they will be protected from detrimental treatment, retaliation, or employment harassment, and further, that this resolution be circulated to Niagara Regional Council, the councils of local area municipalities within the regional municipality of Niagara, and the board of directors of the Niagara po Peninsula Conservation Authority for their endorsement and support. Do you want to speak to that, Councillor Dubino? Yes, I would, Your Worship. Um, yeah, um, that this this quite honestly to me that this this is something I think municipalities in general should have done a while ago, and you know with some of the challenges that we faced in the region over the last four years, um, I, I think it, it's come time that we need to look proactively and uh, start instituting measures like this to. Uh, prevent things like that from happening again. And that's not to say we had any issues in Fort Erie, because we certainly didn't. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I've had a great relationship with the staff here. They, they're, they're very professional. They have been a great assistance to me as a new counselor. I, I, I want to stress that, that this is not about our staff here in Fort Erie. But like my grandmother used to say when I was growing up, um, it, you, history always repeats itself. And even though you may not think something can happen where you are, it's possible it could unless you learn from the mistakes of others and prevent it from happening here as well. So to that end, um, I think it's about time that we look into this for Fort Erie, look at it as a proactive measure, look at it something for the future. Um, I think it's better that we do it now while we don't have any issues rather than doing it into response that something has come up. So uh, on, with that, I, I would be requesting a recorded vote, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing this pass, hopefully. Okay, any uh, members of council have any questions? So I do, I just wanna make sure that it's crystal clear that this doesn't arise out of any incident or situation that you're familiar with, Council Dubinal, arising in Fort Erie. No, that is absolutely 100% correct. This is a, a proactive measure to learn from the mistakes that we have seen happen elsewhere so that hopefully learning from their mistakes, we can prevent something like that from happening here in the future. I fully acknowledge that uh, you know we, we have a great council, we have great staff, but uh, things don't stay the same forever. We're not always gonna be here. So we have to plan to protect the integrity of the municipality as it exists right now, and that's why I think this uh, this motion is very important. Uh, the other question that I had related to one of the uh, paragraphs in the preamble talking about uh, the uh, 2018 election and uh, the strong message about accountability and transparency. Um, the fact is that there was nominal change on the Town of Fort Erie Council. There was one councillor who didn't run for re-election in his ward, which is the seat that you now occupy, yep. and one other uh, councillor who was defeated, uh, replaced by a former councillor. So not much of a um, indication that there was uh, concern on the part of the residents of Fort Erie. I'll, however, I would acknowledge that uh, at the regional level there was significant turnover. And, it, and if I may respond to that, Your Worship, um, it, yeah, um, Definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm really the only new guy here <laughs> in Fort Erie. We, we have a good council, we have a great municipality, but uh, if you look at the regional municipality of Niagara, 
um, which I think most people uh, will acknowledge. Uh, you know, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, they had three quarters of their council turnover. Um, other municipalities, uh, such as Pelham, Grimsby, and uh, Niagara on the Lake, saw their whole councils um, defeated with newcomers coming in, including their mayors and their local councillors. So I, the, I look at this as you know, if we're we're in a great position here in Fort Erie, and if we're if we're going to take a leadership role and move forward, I think now is the time to do it when things are good, rather than doing it reactively after something has gone wrong. Which, uh, unfortunately, if if other municipalities are looking to do something similar, that might be where they're going. We're not. We're doing this proactively, and uh, that's why I brought this forward. Right. And uh, when your motion first came out, I did. Um, uh, asked some questions of our manager of human resources, Tammy Morden, who provided me with some background. I mean, it, it appears to me that the main thrust of this is to hope that other municipalities and government agencies within Niagara may take up the, uh, the challenge uh, and follow um, whatever steps we may take in Fort Erie. Yes, actually, and uh, thank you for that, Your Worship, um, because I've actually, um, some other councillors, local councillors within the region, uh, you know, from other municipalities have actually reached out and they asked, you know, why are we doing this? And I, I said, it, it's purely proactive, you know, but we, someone's got to stand up and say that, you know, enough is enough on a regional level and that we need to take, you know, the first step forward and, and hopefully get everyone on board and get this conversation started. Um, and I do want to uh, express my appreciation to our uh, manager of employment services, uh, Ms. Morden, as well as uh, our clerk, uh, Ms. Uh, Schofield. They were very, very helpful in uh, assisting me with the drafting of this motion, providing me with background on the policies that exist and, uh, you know, how we can fit this all together. They were a great resource. We have great staff in Fort Erie. I think... Uh, a measure like this only further strengthens that trust that we have for them already. Okay. Are there any other Councillor Noyes? Thank you, and I'm very much in support of this. I just have one question in regards to um, the resolution being circulated, and I have no problem with it being circulated, but we're asking for their endorsement and support. And I'm just wondering why we would be doing that. Councillor uh, Dubinow. Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, I, I think this is important for everyone to endorse. I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, this is a no-brainer. Um, people may have different opinions on that, but but that's mine. Uh, anything we can do to strengthen public trust and uh, you know strengthen the transparency and accountability in local governance is very important. And if we take a leadership role and, and we say this is something we're doing in Fort Erie, and that we go to other municipalities and we ask them, we say we'd like you to come on board and we'd like you to do this. There's nothing forcing them to endorse this or support it, but I certainly hope they would see the value and the benefit of these policies moving forward and that they would endorse them and support them if they receive this. Councilor Noyes? Okay, uh, any other questions? Then uh, Madam Clerk, this uh, will be a recorded vote. Councilor Zanko? Yes. Councilor Dubineau? Yes. Councilor Noyes? Mayor Redekop. Yes. The vote carries, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we have one more motion to deal with this evening. And uh, Councillor Dubinow, I wonder if I could hand the chair to you so that I can present that. Thank you, Your Worship. And I believe you have a, uh, a motion on the agenda. I do. I move, seconded by Councillor Zanko, uh, whereas Douglastown is a growing area in the town of Fort Erie, currently populated by approximately 615 residents, and whereas there are only two road access points into and out of Douglastown, namely Baker Road and Black Creek Road, and whereas one of the access points, Baker Road, has been temporarily closed in order to permit the installation of underground services and reconstruction of part of the road, thereby reducing the points of access into and out of the area to one, and whereas Black Creek Road is narrow and has virtually no shoulder, and whereas the closure of either point of access to the area increases the potential for an unexpected closure of the other as a result of calamity, cause of nature, or some other reason. Now therefore be it resolved that council direct staff to prepare a report outlining the alternatives 
to add an additional point of access to the Douglastown area of the town, such report to include possible sites, construction, and cost, as well as any other aspect that staff believes appropriate for council's consideration. And if I may just briefly speak to that. Absolutely, Your Worship. Um, this really arises out of the um, current situation where Baker Road is being reconstructed in order to facilitate two new subdivisions, which will increase the population of the area. And uh, in view of that and the um, limited um, width of Black Creek Road as it progresses towards the Niagara Parkway, it seems to me that it would be appropriate if, if there is the possibility of an alternate point of access uh, and egress, and uh, staff can at least look into that, see whether there are some unopened road allowances or road allowances that may facilitate that or some other alternative. So this is really born out of that situation and probably should have been given greater attention up until now. Thank you, Your Worship. Do any members of council have questions? Councillor Noyce. Thank you, Councillor Dubino. I'm very much in favor of this. I don't think it comes as any surprise. Um, and I did want to mention in that the mayor touched on it about the new homes going in. There's two new subdivisions going in. I think collectively there's going to be 500 new homes. One subdivision is about 300. I think the other is around 200. So if we have 615 residents now, if there's two people per home um, in the new homes, that's going to be 1,000 new new people and probably 1,000 new cars um, accessing this part, this um, this neighborhood. So I think it's really important that we do look at this and um, that we make sure that we have uh, an alternative and a safe alternative, um, which Black Creek Road is not. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noyes. Um, Your Worship, was there anything else you wanted to add? Have any other councillors have questions? Okay, then in that case, I will call the question. All those in favor? And it passes unanimously. And I hand the chair back over to you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Councillor Dubonneau. Well done. Uh, there are no other motions. That takes us to notices of motion. Councillor Noyes. Thank you, Mayor Redekop. I have two. Um, one is the, the first one is that uh, we look into the cessation of train whistles where there are crossing arms, and the, the, that we, we consider that, and also that the traffic calming, I, I'm gonna go back to the other one. I think that there is a process that was outlined to make sure that their safety has to come first, and there's a process that's outlined, so I'd like us to um, follow that process and see if the end result is what, is what I hope for anyway. Um, and the second motion is the traffic calming study be completed to, to address the concerns of speed on the roads. And that traffic calming uh, motion is relative to the whole town? So you're, you'd be looking for a report from staff for both of these? I, I think um, what we're looking, I think when it comes forth, I think it's more uh, funding so that the traffic calming study can go ahead. I'm sure um, Mr. Walsh will have some input into that about, um, I don't know if he has, he'll have all the fact, facts and figures yet, but I, I do think um, in discussing it with him briefly, he was very much in favor of this, but he, there, there does need to be money for the, for the study to be done and that, that hopefully next year, if this is passed, there'll be money in our budget to, to provide the funding for this study. Dr. Zanko, are you on uh, infrastructure services? Do you know when the next subcommittee meeting is? I'm going to be circulating a memo to members of council because some of the motions that are coming forward are really operational issues that I think could be and should be dealt with in uh, subcommittee, and that may alleviate some of the need for us to do this. But uh, when is the next? Uh, uh, the next meeting is July 24th, and, and actually uh, traffic calming measures is something that's on Mr. Walsh's okay. Uh, so uh, Okay, that's, that's great. So um, both of these hopefully uh, will be brought up during that uh, subcommittee meeting, which is next, a week from Wednesday. Um, you've given your notice of motion, though, Councillor Noyes, and so that will be, if, if it's not adequately addressed between now and then, it'll be on the agenda for, is it August the? August 26th, Your Worship. August 26th. Any other notices of motion? Uh, then that takes us to um, the report 
With respect to the Sunset Drive property and Councillor Zanko, you have the resolution. Yes, I do. For that. Uh, thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Dubineau. PDS 46 2019, proposed zoning bylaw amendment 1211 and 1225 Sunset Drive, Thomas R. Richardson, Sullivan Mahoney, LLP, Alfred Beam, and Janet Beam, owner. The council approves the amendments to the town's zoning bylaw number 129-90 as detailed in appendix three of report number PDS 46-2019 for the lands known as 1211 and 1225 Sunset Drive and further that council authorizes staff to prepare the necessary bylaw. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor of the recommendation? That is carried. That then takes us to consideration of bylaws, and I have bylaws 105 and 106 that will have to come out of the package. Are there any other bylaws that anyone would like removed from the package? Councillor Noyes? Law number 113 to 19. 113? Yes. So that's the short term rentals bylaw? Yes. Okay. Any others? So, Councillor Noyes, you have the. Uh, Resolution for first and second reading of that bylaw package as amended. I wonder if you could proceed with that. Yes, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Zanko that the bylaw package containing 101 2019 to authorize entry into the grant funding agreement for physician recruitment of Dr. Joseph Felic? Fer Ferlick? Ferlick? Ah. <laughs> Bylaw number 102, 2019, to authorize entry into the grant funding agreement to establish capital improvements to a clinic for physician recruitment with Dr. Jeffrey Remington. Bylaw number 103, 2019, to assume primary services in lots 479, 480, 481, 482, plan 520, located on the south side of Queen Street between Central Avenue and Douglas Street, Nanaviti. Bylaw number 104, 2019, to exempt certain laws in plan 59M-452 from part, land, part lot control block 6 parts 1 to 5, dash 192, 196, 200, and 2004 Alderson Court, Park Lane Home Builders Limited, Ed Letitian. Bylaw number 107, 2019, to authorize the execution of an amending subdivision with 1639875 Ontario Limited, which is Frank Q, King Street Subdivision. Bylaw number 108, 2019, to authorize the entry into a development agreement with Bradley Brewster and William Denham, 1724 Rebecca Street. Bylaw number 109, 2019, to amend bylaw number 97, 2015, to appoint deputy clerks for the purposes of commissioners for taking affidavits act and courts of justice act. Bylaw number 110, 2019, to appoint William Henry Nobles as building inspector for the corporation, the town of Fort Erie. Bylaw number 111, 2019, to establish a system for administrative penalties. Bylaw number 112, I think that's that is amended, right, or something? Um, bylaw number 112, 2019, to authorize the sale of lands in Fort Erie Business Park, Zero Commerce Parkway, Harbor Realtor in Holdings Incorporated, Andrew Harbor. Bylaw number 114, to authorize the entry into agreement with Rutherford Prosecutions to appoint Janet Rutherford as hearing officer for the corporation, the town of Fort Erie, under the administrative penalty system, and to repeal bylaw number 86 2014. Bylaw number 115 2019 to appoint temporary municipal law enforcement officers for the corporation, the town of Fort Erie. Bylaw number 116 2019 to amend fees and charges bylaw 4009 as amended short term rentals as given first and second reading. All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. That bylaw package is on the floor as amended for uh, questions or comments. I have a question, uh, Mr. Brady, with respect to uh, bylaw 104. It makes ref this is with respect to uh, Park Lane Homes. It makes reference to plan 59M452. The memo that's attached uh, or the memo has attached to it an R plan, 59R16449. Um, do we have the right? Do we have the right plan? 
Okay, so um, before this is presented to me for signature, we'll make sure that it is the right, correct plan. It may be that the uh, reference plan was simply entered into or prepared prior to the actual um, registration of the uh, subdivision agreement. Uh, if there are no other questions, then we'll go to uh, Councillor Zanko. You have the uh, third and final reading. So this is the amended package. 105, 106, 113 are not in the package? Yes. Um, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes that bylaws 101 2019-103-2019-104-2019-107-2019-109-2019-109-2019-110-2019-111-2019-112-2019 115-2019-115-2019-116-2019 are given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Are there any questions or comments with respect to the bylaws in the amended package? Call the question. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. So, Councillor Noyes, um, unless either you or Councillor Zanko are opposed, I would propose to deal with bylaws 105 and 106 together. So would you please proceed with first and second reading on those? File number 105, 2019, to exempt certain lots in plan 59M-470 from part lot, part lot control block 69 parts 1 to 8, Peace Bridge Village, Ashton Homes, Western Limited, A. Vercello. Bylaw number 106, 2019, to authorize the execution of an amended subdivision agreement with Marina Green Acres Development Incorporated, Farhan Adam, Farhim Adam, and Luciano Ruti, High, La High Points Estates Phase 2 and 3. All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Um, Mr. Brady, I would ask you to, to check the same thing with respect to the... Uh, Deeming bylaw relative to uh, East Bridge Village. I think what happens is the reference plan is prepared and then it's turned into a M plan. Uh, but since real estate isn't my area of expertise, maybe you could help me with that. Thank you. Um, okay, so third and final reading, uh, Councillor Zanko, if there are, unless there are questions. Councillor Zanko. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes, that bylaw number 105-2019, 106-2019 are given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor? That is carried. Um, Councillor Noyes, you have uh, third and final read, or first and second reading for bylaw 113. Yeah, sure. Okay. Move Councilor, by Lubitsch, my... Councilor Lubitsch does it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just okay, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor um, Lubino this time to amend business licensing bylaw number 217 uh, 05, licensing and regulating short term rental uses. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So that bylaw is on the floor for questions and comments. Councillor Dubinow. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, um, I, I, I took a look over the bylaw and, and uh, the, the specifics of it. I'm actually quite pleased by the compromise that this strikes, um, you know, with, with everything that we've had going on with this issue. I actually uh, made a point of uh, stopping in at Town Hall earlier today to um, convey my gratitude to Ms. Dolch and uh, her staff for all the work that uh, she did on this, but uh, I was notified she's uh, taken a, a well-earned vacation <laughs> away from this place, so uh, I didn't get that chance, but I fired off an email. Um, I've, I've had some discussions with uh, various people in the community as well. Um, the fact that this is a pilot project I think is very important because it gives us the opportunity to tweak and change things if uh, needs arise, but I think for, for the time being, I think uh, we need to come to you know some sort of uh, finality almost on passing something here and to that end I think it's a great compromise and I'm uh, happy to support this 
Councillor Noyes. Thank you. I am glad to say that we're moving forward on it. My concern, and I'm not going to go into the details, I don't think we're going to um, be doing much for the party houses. Um, but, but anyway, I did want to bring people's attention to your list for penalties and fines. Um, that's at the end of the... At the uh, end of it, yeah. You have, and, and I know that in the body of the report, we're, we're, we're basically dealing with, with two um, lists of bylaws. There's a bylaw enforcement against noise and other things, too, that shows up in this one, and then it looks like it's blank, like uh, administrative penalties, and there's nothing beside failure to comply with Fire Protection Previ Prevention Act slash fire code. There's nothing under failure to comply with Building Code Act. I know that there is. It's just not on this list because it falls under under another bylaw. And the same thing with noise and nuisance. I, I, again, I do know that there is a fine, there is a penalty. Um, here we're just outlining demerit points. But I would encourage that if someone was looking at this, they would think, oh, I don't get, all I get is demerit points. I'm not charged. I know in the body of this report, it refers you to another bylaw that where the penalties and fees would come into effect for, for those breaches, the failure to comply. I'm just wondering if there should not be maybe an asterisk or a star or something and a footnote that says, you know, um, for the fines and penalties of these three, please refer to bylaw number whatever. Councilor Noyes, I think that's an excellent idea and I think that could be inserted uh, in the column, column four. So as an example of failure to comply with Fire Protection and Prevention Act slash fire code, C bylaw, whatever. So uh, if you want to move to amend the uh, schedule to provide for that, I'll entertain that. Okay. Yes, um, I will move then that. I think uh, exactly as, as the mayor had stated that, that there's some direction uh, for those this list to give to people where other bylaws come into enforce. Okay, so your, your amendment is to amend Appendix 1 to Schedule 13 to insert reference to the bylaw relative to the three items which don't show a specific administrative penalty. Madam Clerk, since you were distracted, did you get the gist of that amendment? Yes, I believe I did, Your Worship. Uh, the amendment is going to be to Appendix 1 to Schedule 13 to insert the reference to the particular bylaw in the column four. That's pretty impressive because I know that you were also speaking to Mr. Brady, but I'm, I'm going to assume that you also picked up what he was trying to convey. Yes, and I did. so that is very impressive. Okay, everybody clear on the amendment and we need a seconder for that, Councillor Dubinow. Uh, if there are no questions or comments, all those in favor of the amendment, that is carried. Uh, Councillor Noyes, you still have the floor. There is nothing further. Any other questions or comments? Um, it occurred to me in reviewing this bylaw that uh, section 4.5H, which appears on page seven, sorry, seven of the package. So it's section 4.5H, uh, V on page seven of the package or page five of the bylaw and page eight, section 5.51F, both of which make reference to outside sleeping accommodations should probably say outside sleeping and sleeping accommodations because I, I think we would end up with people sleeping or could end up with people sleeping in tents in the backyard, which is not something we want to encourage, I'm sure. Would any councillor like to move an amendment to include the word sleeping um, and between uh, or before sleeping accommodations in 4.5 HV and uh, section 5.1 F? Councillor Noyes, seconder. Councillor Zanko. Madam Clerk, are you clear on that? Okay, is everybody clear? All those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Uh, any other questions or comments or amendments? So um, we'll go then to third and final reading, Councillor Zanko. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes, that bylaw 113-2019 are given third and final reading, signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Are there any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? 
that is carried. That then takes us to the uh, confirmatory bylaw. Councillor Dubonneau, you have that resolution. Resolution number 13. Yes, I do have it, uh, Your Worship. Thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Noyes at bylaw number 117 2019 to confirm the actions of Council at its Council and Committee meeting held on July 8th, 2019, and its Council meeting held on July 15th, 2019 is given first and second reading. All those in favor? That is carried. Councillor Zanko, you have third and final reading for that bylaw. Yes, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Dubineau. That bylaw number 117-2019 is given third and final reading to be signed by the mayor and the clerk under the corporate seal. Are there any questions or comments? All those in favor? That is carried. That takes us to scheduling of meetings. Uh, Councillor Zanko. Thank you, Your Worship. We have a Fort Erie Active Transportation Committee meeting tomorrow um, being held here at Town Hall in conference room one at 5.30 p.m. We also have an infrastructure uh, subcommittee meeting being held here on Wednesday, July 24th at 5 p.m. in conference room three. And that's it for me. Any others, Councillor Noyes and then Councillor Dubonneau? Yes, we have a, um, a, a PDS, a business subcommittee meeting, August 8th at 9 a.m. Planning and development at eight at nine a.m. on August the eighth in conference room three. It's it's now moved from the Wednesday. Okay, and that's in the morning. Is it usually in the morning? It's usually at three o'clock. Okay, perfect. Uh, Councillor Dubonneau. Yeah, Your Worship, we have a a. a Douglas and an Albert, uh, uh, or sorry, Douglas and an Albert Street uh, Park Master Plan Open House. Um, it's tomorrow between five and seven p.m. at the uh, Douglas Heights Senior Center at two sixty-five uh, High Street. So uh, anyone who's interested, I'm, I'm hoping they can come out. I, I plan on being there as much uh, at that time. I've I've had a chance to look at what they propose. It's pretty exciting. I hope people get a chance to see. Okay, there's a, an affordable housing committee meeting uh, Wednesday, July 17th, 9.30, and also uh, a stakeholder consultation that same day starting at 1 o'clock. Uh, there being no other meetings, Councillor Dubonau, do you have the resolution to adjourn? Yes, I do, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Noyes that Council adjourns at 7.47 p.m. to reconvene into a regular meeting of Council on August 26, 2019. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, folks.